McQuistian. For over 25 years, talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, CF accountants and consultants adding value to clients throughout the region, the University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. You know, I hope you tuned in the past couple of weeks when we aired the history of oil from 1846 right up until 2015. Now on those programs we examined the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania, in Baku, the discovery of the huge field in Beaumont known as Spindletop. We took a look at the importance of oil in the Middle East, the formation of OPEC in 1960, the gasoline lines of the 70s, the price fluctuation of the past 25 years, peak oil, and energy security. Now on this program, our experts will stop looking backwards and begin looking into their crystal balls at the future. Let's meet them now. On my left, Bruce Cutright is a research scientist associate at the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas in Austin. Bruce, welcome to the program. Thank you, Dennis. Glad to be here. Sitting next to you is Jackie Pick. She's a lawyer and she uh, has worked in the energy business, her family worked in the energy business, I should say. She spent seven years on Capitol Hill. Uh, she was counsel to the chairman of the subcommittee on the Constitution in the House of Representatives. She hosts the Jackie Daly Show on radio. And more importantly, she's the new executive vice president and chief operating officer of the National Center for Policy Analysis. Jackie, welcome to the program. Good to be here, sir. Yeah. And sitting next to you is our good friend, Ed Blessing. Ed Blessing is an independent oil operator. At, he's a frequent guest on this program. He's a board member of Petro Victory, where they're drilling a well right now in Paraguay, and I'm sure you're there on the site pretty much every week. Isn't that true? Absolutely. I'm <laughs> sure that's true. Now, Jackie, I'm going to begin with you. Okay. We've looked a lot at the back at history and previous programs, but for right now, uh, you have the opportunity to interview a lot of people, as I do, about pr primarily in your case from energy. So looking at what they say, uh, what is your take and what is their take on the future of oil? Well, the truth is no one has a crystal ball. And if you ask any two of them, you'll never get the same answer twice, I promise. So that's a tough question. I say to them all the time, trillion dollar question for you, you know, what is oil going to do in six months or a year? Especially there, you get differing answers. But we're sure about one thing. Oil is here to stay. Oil has a future. The future is certain almost as much as death and taxes, right? So you can't live without it. There's no substitute for it. Natural gas is moving in. We still use coal a lot around the world. But nothing really takes the place of fossil fuels across the board, not even in 30 years. Even with all the pressure from environmental groups, government, taxation, etc., you still maintain that? Well, pressure is one thing, but you have to deal in the world of the real, take your world as you find it, and the facts are there is no substitute yet. I mean, don't underestimate American ingenuity, for sure. We don't have a crystal ball, we don't know. But for now, oil, definitely. Right. And I, would, you, would it be fair to say that most of the people you've interviewed over time and I, I asked this to Ed Blessing before on a, on a previous program about whether they predicted the impact of fracking over the last 25 years. Would, would, did you find anybody who had that crystal ball? Oh no, I mean if you, tell, if you ask people now, they will admit they thought George Mitchell was crazy for a long, long time. Yeah. No one took him seriously, no one believed in it, uh, or at least what he was trying to do, and that it would come out the way that it has. So no, I mean as late as 2005, the experts going before Congress said, we have a crisis. We're running out of energy. That was not that long ago. No, oh, it wasn't. And we did those programs on peak oil in yes, 2006 right. yeah. and used those clips before. Right. Now, Bruce, looking back at the geology of these things, um, one of the things that we talked about on a previous program with you was that there's a lot of this there. It's a question of price. It's a question of technology uh, and everything else. But if, if, if we are sure about how much we have produced in the past, uh, are you equally certain that there is still, un, I wouldn't say unlimited, but, but so much that we haven't even tapped into in places like the Arctic and other places like that, not to mention all the work over the present wells? Exactly. And, and truly, the only number we do know is what we've used. But we do know that there's at least four times available of, for the future development from what we've used in the past. And that's a minimum number. 
uh, I, we've mentioned before, the Arctic has not been uh, developed except for minor drilling off the, the north slope of Alaska. Right now, there's a huge movement from the Russians, from the Americans, from the international oil companies to move into the Arctic. There's a huge development going on offshore uh, Brazil with what's called the pre-salt deposits. We're producing oil from formations as much as 30,000 feet deep. Uh, they're just beginning to find uh, productive wells in the same type of formations offshore Angola, basically offshore West Africa. That same development is available offshore of the east coast of the United States, but we've had regulations that has prohibited Do we have a there. political issue there, do we? We have a political yeah. issue. So the political issue is limiting the reserves. It's not the reserves themselves that are limited. Well, so, oh, okay, so look, I'm, I'm not an oil and gas guy. I got 30,000 feet in water. That's right. So wh wh what, do, what do we run down here? A PVC pipe or something <laughs> down five miles? I'm unclear on how that works. The drilling technology, uh, for comparison, if we were to drill a well, let's say 30,000 feet deep, in Texas on shore, that well might cost us 12 to 25 million dollars. Pretty expensive. But to drill a 30,000 foot well offshore Brazil in the pre-salt uh, formations, that well itself might cost a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And so the reason we're doing that is because those formations are so productive that that well will produce a profitable income over the life of that well that will recover all of that cost of exploration. So those deep formations that we're now looking at, offshore Brazil, and deep formations, deep water development in the Gulf of Mexico, offshore Southeast Asia, offshore Australia, offshore Arctic, every one of those formations is still available to be drilled and is unquantified for the present time. This is the kind of stuff you hear, right, Jackie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. On my yeah. show? Yeah. Yeah, you, you don't know the future. And, and no matter what, estimates always grow. Always. Yeah. They don't go the other way. That's, that's for sure. We have never had that. Now, Ed, there, there is at least one person watching this program who doesn't know the difference in an independent oil producer and one of the majors. So tell us what that is, number one. And then you know, there was an announcement the other day that Exxon's going into the Arctic and all this. I mean, tell us, uh, just give us some idea of what this is all about and how exciting it is from your perspective. Well, an independent, generally, it's uh, it's smaller just by definition, and we have a lot more flexibility. Uh, sometimes we have to work harder to get what Exxon does, but with you know, Exxon, we've heard Scott Nauman, and he's brilliant, and uh, they can afford people like that. The excitement is what Drucker said at one time. We talk about the oil business. There's a risk below the surface, and then there's a risk above the surface, and it's political, and it becomes very serious. I mean, we talked about the Arctic. China, Russia, uh, the U.S., uh, it, it's opening up and the thaw we're having, you know, 20 years ago, as far as the Canadians were concerned, their international defense was getting on the phone and telling the U.S. that it's on its way. Now they're exposed. And for the first time in the last 10 years, the Canadians have to worry about their security. So in one way, we're ending up with a great partner. We're, and with, with Canada, we've always been a good partner even though we can't seem to get a pipeline approved to bring some of the product <laughs> down. Uh, the Chinese are more than willing to do that if we don't, but uh, <laughs> just look at the Arctic and what's going on up there, as, as exactly. you just said. I exactly. mean, we, we just don't know what the reserves are. Well, um, you, you mentioned something that we, two things really, that we really haven't touched on very much. And first, let's get the pipeline out of the way. That person over here watching this program has heard of the Keystone Pipeline because it's been a lot of people want to do it. Uh, the administration doesn't want to do it. What the heck is it, and does it really matter? Especially given where we are now with oil piling up in Cushing, Oklahoma, we're going to have to get pickup trucks and put it in their beds if we don't uh, stop with all the oil. Yeah, I, I can't see where it's that big of a big of a deal. It's a pipeline that's going to bring heavy oil down from Canada to the U.S. where we can refine it. Uh, it's safer. We just, what, two, three weeks ago had a train wreck. With, uh, yeah. It's safer. The safest method of transporting yeah. oil is by pipeline. And, transporting and any volatile substance is yeah, by pipeline. Yeah, and we've seen the truck wrecks and that train that derailed with all the oil in it and pipelines, uh, maybe they leak, but in, and we just uh, cordoned up part of uh, Alaska and we know that with the pipelines in Alaska, the, uh, the moose up there like to hide under it because it's warmer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're... we're Dennis, uh, I, I would add for you that 
Keep it all in perspective. There are greater than 2 million miles of pipeline already beneath